So powerful. So can you tell us, please, can you share your story with us on visualization and the effect that it had on your experience? We're talking about the Olympics, sir. We are talking about that little bit. <laughs> I went to the Olympics when I, well, I had my birthday, my 17th birthday at the Olympics. So I was just a kid in high school. And it was, it was overwhelmingly wonderful, the whole process from just making the team to getting the uniforms and meeting the fellow athletes. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was overwhelming. And uh, I had been taught um, by my mother, uh, basically the, the ABCs of what was to become uh, sports psychology. And one of the, the major parts of it is to be able to see the path that you want to take in your mind's eye and to see, to look at the responses and the changes and the things that might come and happen to you and be able to re, to react in a way that's in line with your goal. Um, and for an athlete, that goal is to win, you know, or at least play well. But for me, certainly, it was to win. I wanted to win. And I had a chance to win. I was, I was really good going, you know, held the world record going into the Olympics. I was favored to win. Um, unfortunately, I got really sick the day before the trials of my race. And I was taken to the hospital and and um, told that I was going to have an appendectomy. Uh, my appendicitis, my appendix was getting ready to explode. And I refused the surgery. Um, this meant too much to me. I didn't care if my appendix was going to explode. I was going to swim anyway. I was only 17 now. I was 17. It's so had they, had they cut into you, you would have been out of the... <laughs> Nice. Oh, yeah. I would have been out because the race was the next day. <laughs> uh, the trials of my race, the finals were later. But in, in refusing it, um, caused quite a hubbub, as you might imagine. <laughs> all the doctors and nurses and the medical staff was all trying to talk me into it. And I... I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And they tried to get the Olympic committee to come and sign off on it and they wouldn't do it. So they went out searching around in Tokyo for my parents and finally found them. About eight hours after they put me in the hospital, my parents showed up. And during that eight hours, it, it just struck me, okay, I didn't know the word visualization at the time. That was a, that word hadn't been coined. <laughs> uh, but I just saw myself swimming. The easiest way to say it is that. I saw myself swimming. I knew how to swim this race. I could beat everybody in the pool. And so I, I started to go over it in my mind with the, with, with no extra motive to it. It was like, okay, I, I, they're not going to take my appendix out. I'm just going to do what I normally do, which is to start to swim the race in my mind. Well, my parents refused to sign the, the and after I had begged them to please make sure that I swam, and a deal was struck between the, doctors and my parents that they would take my blood every four hours night and day confine me to a room in the olympic village infirmary i couldn't eat anything uh, they would allow me to have jello and hawaiian punch <laughs> that was all i got to eat but i was i was uh, 
I was free. I could swim the next day. And I swam terribly. You might expect there was a lot of stress. I swam 15 seconds slower than my world record, but I qualified. You were in the 400 meter individual. individual yeah. Oh, so quite a long race. Quite a long and difficult race and very taxing. So, you know, it's one of the hardest races in swimming, if not the hardest. Mm. And so I swam terribly the, the day after being in the hospital, went back and was back in the uh, infirmary with the harpies coming in every four hours to draw that blood. Oh, day and night. The next day was awful, just absolutely awful. I was down, I was defeated. How in the world can I do this? I swam terribly. All of this stuff came up and just sort of beat me, to, beat me down. I made it through that day. And the next day, was the day of the race. And I go, oh man, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And I said, well, I know how to swim this race. I'm not, I haven't gotten in bad shape. It's just the jello and Hawaiian punch and being awakened every four hours. That's the only thing that's the matter. I haven't, I haven't lost any strength. I, all that's the matter with me is in my mind right now. And that was it. What do I do? What do I do? And it's not what, what's bad, but it's like, what can I do? And I started, I remembered. It was like, you've got to, you know how to swim this race. Just swim it in your mind. You, you're, you know, you can't have any visitors. You can't talk. You couldn't even see my parents. So what can I do? I can swim the race in my head. And it, more than that, in my being. And I did that over and over and over and over and started to build some confidence. I knew how the butterfly felt, that my arms would just be dying and I would be just fighting for breath at the end of the butterfly. It's a very hard stroke. And next stroke is a backstroke and I'd turn over and I'd get to breathe and I would just concentrate on breathing the whole time and just you know, getting my, my kind of physical composure back. And the next stroke is the breaststroke and I was the best breaststroker in the race. So I just, I just knew what it was gonna feel like. I just was going, okay, there's nobody that can beat me in this stroke and I'm gonna just push it. And then the freestyle is the last stroke. And I knew that to win this race, I would have to swim through the biggest pain that I, it was always that way in the 400 I am, it always hurt. But the freestyle was the pain when the oxygen was down, the lactic acid was huge and I just had to swim through every single barrier and I did it again and again in my mind I got so that I could visualize the barrier I had to go through which was this red curtain of lava like writhing stuff that I had to swim right through and it was burning and hot and I could swim through it and all of a sudden I was in good shape I was in really good shape. I knew what I had to do. I knew what it was gonna feel like. I knew where I had to push, where I could get some rest and some air and where I just had to give absolutely everything. Well, they let me go back to my room in the Olympic Village before my race. And all of a sudden things were normal. I wasn't in the, in the infirmary anymore and I got really, scared and worried and i'm i'm been sick and you know run, run through all the bad stuff swim the race one more time in my mind and it wasn't working it was just i was just not able to rise above it and thank the dear lord i had a uh the idea to turn my transistor radio on we have iphones now back then we had little transistor radios for the earplugs 
and I listened to the uh, broadcast of the Olympics on the radio, and there was a guy that did something that was just totally outrageous. He, he was running the 10,000 meters, came to the last lap. He was a full minute faster than his best time. He had run his heart out and he really didn't have a chance. He had run too hard. The strategy was bad, but it was okay. One more lap. He starts a finishing kick with 400 meters to go, which is ridiculously stupid. And he gets a body length or so ahead. And then the guy with the fastest finishing kick in the world catches and passes him with 200 meters to go. Ron Clark. He's either New Zealand or Australia. I forget which. And Billy Mills was all of a sudden behind. And then another guy sees an opening between Clark and Mills and tries to push in between it and pushes Mills over three steps off his stride, one hand and one knee on the ground, a hundred meters to go. Mills got up, gave us one of the most amazing finishes that we have ever, ever had in the Olympic Games. He sprinted that 100 meters like he had just started and passed Ron Clark and won by two yards with his arms up in the air. The dorm erupted in a, in a yell. I went crazy. <clears throat> Later, I met Billy Mills, and I said, how did you, what did you do? How did you? And he said, well, I just saw myself winning the race. He said, I, I just got up, and I just, you know, we didn't have the term visualization back then. So as I saw this, and then I went and did it. Well, I was so excited. <laughs> by his performance that <laughs> I thought I was floating off of my mattress so high that it'd be dangerous if I fell down. And I reached my arm around to see how high above the mattress I was. I was, I was on the mattress, of course, but that's how much he influenced me. And come the race that night, um, is sitting in the ready room, getting ready to swim psychologically. And all of a sudden, I psyched myself out again. I went, I'm sick. I've lost weight. I haven't eaten. This is the finals of the Olympics. What am I going to do? And then one more time, I swam that race in my mind. I went through the butterfly, the backstroke, the breaststroke, and the writhing curtains of showers of pain and at the end of swimming through it i knew i was going to win and i did <laughs> i didn't remember anything until the press conference an hour after the race and a reporter calls me or asks me how did you how did you win that race with an appendicitis and you should have had surgery and you haven't eaten. And I said, well, I just forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Dick, for that story. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful story. It was, it was really cool. Um, my biggest supporter, the, the guy who, uh, really helped me become a swimmer was one of the great Aussies uh, of all time, one of the, the best swimmer of his era, Murray Rose. And the other guy that really helped me was Terry Buck, who was for years, I believe, a head coach for an Australian team. And he was, he had qualified for the finals of the Olympic Games, but he knew he couldn't beat anybody. He was he was going to get last, 
I was sitting next to him. I knew nobody could beat me. I was going to get first. Everybody else, the other six competitors are all tied up in knots. <laughs> Terry and I are relaxed and having a good time and a laugh. <laughs> and it just shows the power uh, that the mind has, you know, uh, and I always think of that, that that Terry Buck and I sitting there with a whole string of guys, six other guys just tied up in knots. And the two of us are just like, we're looking for a Sheila. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it awesome. Was, it that's was, it was awesome. wonderful. Just wonderful. Yeah. Wow. What a powerful, what a powerful experience. It doesn't get more, much more powerful than that. No such a a wonderful um application of of uh of all the philosophy and all the but it just happened you and i think even by you mentioned a couple of times it wasn't branded by visualization and sometimes when you brand a word it you, you have an association to it yeah yeah no it was it was just to put many words to it where now one seems to do it was I was swimming the race in my mind. I was doing in, and it got very, very real. It was, it was, uh, I could feel it, the, especially the pain. It wasn't, you know, it was like, I, this is what I had to go through and to feel it and to literally put myself through it. Um, yeah, I don't know if you'd call, even call that visualization. I, I, I don't know what the word has morphed into, but that was what it was. I saw what I had to do, and I did it. Maybe it starts off with a, what we call visualization. But, I mean, Joe Dispenza talks about this a lot, that, you know, what, what the body feels, um, the brain doesn't know the difference between what you actually experience and what you, what you visualize. And so the same chemistry happens exactly in your brain that sends off those same peptides to every single cell of your body whether it's experienced or not experienced and so the mind is really what determines the experience yeah yeah and and there are things that get triggered that don't have to go through the mind uh, danger and the response to danger and these these things that are going to send things into your blood system that normally you would have to respond to. In an extreme case such as mine, it got so I didn't have to, my body didn't respond to him because my mind was too powerfully going in and um, in anticipation of the reality. Mm. I don't know, I'm kind of getting lost here. No, 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 I'm with you, I'm with you. That brings me to another question is like, well, how's that served you since? <laughs> it's pretty easy for me to get my, myself, uh, I'm in my seventies, so it's not so easy to get my body to do it anymore. <laughs> but uh, my self, my being can, can move into um, getting something done and I can get it, you know, as long as I understand the limits of my body. Um, and so don't try to do something that's, uh, Olympian. I'm not an Olympian anymore, <laughs> Right. but I still, I still use it. It's like a second nature. I, I don't even think about it. It's like, okay, I know what I have to do. Mm. I'm gonna, I see it. I know what it takes and I go through it and I go through it. And then when it comes up, it's, it's uh, somehow kind of a little bit pre-programmed and makes, makes it easier.